okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just have to repeat welcome to the new watchers of this, uh, this uh, session. Uh, please read a couple of messages on the message board on, on Fronter. And please um, fill in the evaluation form if you, if you would care to do that. And also pay attention to the two new papers that are posted, because they may be useful for you um, in supporting you when you read the lecture notes. Well, this course <coughs> um, should give you an insight into various aspects of international transportation with focus on trade and, uh, and how <coughs> transportation is set up to, to sort of uh, meet the demand from this trade. We have also presented to you documentation and insurance issues connected to international transport. Um, the course is, has been strategic in nature not much calculations, um, but it should give you an insight as a basis for, uh, for taking this further into more detailed studies or into a situation where we are going to work with this uh, later on. So um, <coughs> we have been through various transport modes, sea transport, air transport and land transport. Uh, and everything has been uh, focusing on, uh, on international issues. Um, we have also discussed uh, international logistics, supply chain management, and, and uh, with, again with special attention to, to international conditions. Uh, as you know, you have an exam, exam coming up, and you also have a deadline for this, uh, this uh, assignment coming up quite, uh, rather soon. Um, and both of them uh, have to be passed to be able to, to complete the course. Yeah, this is, uh, you know about, all about this, so I just go on to the, to the lecture plan. Uh, <coughs> I will start by, uh, by summarizing Harald Gjelde's lectures, which are uh, starting with an introduction, then going on with uh, maritime transport uh, and um, um, ports, terminals, and environmental issues, which are the, the basic parts of his, uh, his, his lectures. And now you should uh, ask questions if you want to clarify something. <coughs> um, <coughs> he started with uh, discussing and presenting some main drivers, uh, key drivers for uh, which affects international supply chains and also international trade, uh, which has to do with the um, globalization of consumption production structures. Uh, we discussed that a bit when we also uh, when I lectured on international trade, comparative advantage that, uh, that companies are taking advantage of, uh, of low wage costs uh, in, uh, in developing countries and, uh, and uh, newly industrialized countries. But they also take advantage of knowledge and uh, experiences in high cost countries. As you may know, there is quite a lot of there are quite a lot of international companies that has entered this region in in Norway because of the shipbuilding uh, oil and gas cluster that is located here. So this goes both ways, uh, but at different levels. <coughs> there is a di division of labor uh, going on globally, where. Uh, manufacturing of uh, more or less standardized products 
in larger series takes place in, in more low cost uh, oriented economies. Whereas complex, high value products, at least per unit, are more uh, likely to be uh, produced uh, like in this region. <coughs> so more capital intensive, but not so large scale production, more complex products, are uh, the tendencies that they are produced in, in, in more high cost developed economies. Um, <coughs> Productivity has to do with what I just said, uh, because everything is about productivity. That's what you are, as a company, is making money off from, is to be more productive than your competitors. Um, <coughs> structural changes in demand and supply side is also in line with what I just said, that uh, there, is a, there is a division of labor globally, which is... Uh, which has changed as compared to the situation, say, some not more than perhaps 20 years ago. Um, all this, this productivity increase in, in the supply chains, and then we can think about both transportation and production, has uh, contributed to a lowering of prices and increased economic growth world worldwide, um, which again then results in a growth in world trade flows. So there is a self-reinforcing mechanism at best here. Increased productivity, lower prices, um, which increases demand. And if you have Economies of scale in production, you get lower prices, there you go. So this can be a, a circular, circular uh, kind of self-reinforcing uh, process. His foils are much more fancy than mine, uh, at least in terms of style. Uh, globalization, <coughs> I've talked a bit about this uh, already, uh, a changed division of labor. Um, much more transportation, which raises a question which uh, was discussed when, I believe, when you, you were lectured about uh, environmental issues, <coughs> that there is a discussion about whether the, the, and the social costs of transportation is internalized in the fuel costs that the, the, the shippers are paying for, let's say, bunker fuel for, uh, for ships and, uh, in particular, and, but also jet fuel for, for aircraft. Some of them are part of the Kyoto Agreement. So, um, so we believe that actually global transport is underpriced. It's too cheap. Um, barriers to trade is another important uh, issue which uh, has been removed in uh, many, many cases. Um, which, is, uh, which has been an important, let's say, stimulus for, uh, for increased uh, global trade. Within the uh, European Union, <coughs> um, and also between Latin America and North America, there has been, uh, been uh, trade barriers have, have been lifted. But the cr criticism is that uh, those big trade alliances are quite protectionists, protectionist against other countries, like for instance the parts of the developing countries. So many, <coughs> or at least some countries like, like Japan, has adapted to this by setting up uh, plants for producing cars, for instance, in, in Europe. 
cars and motorbikes to take advantage of the trade conditions that are, uh, that are part of the EU. So then digging a bit deeper into this, uh, where the, the big boxes, the containers, have been the real, the real uh, revolution with, with respect to, uh, to um, productivity in, in transportation. It allows <coughs> much, much more efficient transport chain and also it, it allows also an intermodal transport chain, as we saw. So uh, <coughs> both security and, uh, and lower handling costs has been a, been a result of this. Supply chains, uh, if you remember the lecture that I gave on this, has become more productive also during uh, more focus on alignment and uh, adaptability worldwide. So, yeah. I think <coughs> what I will do now, I will do, do it a bit differently. I will now leave this and go on with so I follow the sequence in the, in the plan here. Then I can proceed with lecture two, which is about, <coughs> which was about in, in, uh, international trade. Uh, now you have the backdrop for this in the introductory lecture. And, uh, and uh, I gave you a few numbers on, uh, on um, the growth in international trade, uh, <coughs> how the developing countries have uh, increased their share of the world markets quite substantially, and with ch China as the main, main player. So I want you to sort of think about what you heard in the, in the introduction and try to link that to the more theoretical aspects of trade, which I, which I presented to you during uh, lecture two. <coughs> try to answer these four questions during, uh, during lecture two uh, with a theoretical where I <coughs> presented to you a model, a graphical model, on how you could actually understand why trade takes place. I will not repeat that, but it, uh, it was about two countries, high cost, low cost. Um, trade was, uh, was, it was open for trade, uh, and, uh, and then we got uh, an equilibrium price between the low cost and the high cost uh, country. Um, the high cost countries' domestic industry suffered from this. They become uh, subjected to competition from low cost countries. Whereas <coughs> the low cost country uh, benefited in terms of that their manufacturing industry got a, a strong increase in demand. Whereas the consumers in the low-cost country, they suffered because the prices went up. On the other hand, consumers in the rich countries benefited because the prices went down as compared to the previous situation with the high-cost producer as a monopolist in this very simplified uh, framework. But it's fairly intuitive, and it's, uh, <coughs> it's, it gives some insight into why, as to why trade takes place, and it also gives some insights into the welfare effects or the, the distribution of wealth as a result of, uh, of two partners engaging in international trade. Uh, <coughs> so we. We summarized it like this, and you, you should pay attention to this, uh, <coughs> this model that I, I presented in lecture two, and which is given in, in, uh, in the literature by Lindert and Pogel. Um, 
Demand and supply conditions differ and prices differ. Um, it's listed how trade affects production and consumption. How does it uh, affect the well-being? They benefit both, but there are different groups that benefits. And you should be able to, to sort of discuss that uh, in, in during an exam if you get this as a, as a question or a topic. I never make exams before I give this uh, final lecture. <laughs> because then I can talk myself uh, into trouble, so to speak. Um, so, these four questions are uh, sort of was highlighted in this, uh, in this lecture too. Then, <coughs> I go back to um, Yellis lectures. I'm not going to, um, to deal with, uh, summarize the seminar on essay writing, which was uh, actually lecture three. But I'll continue with, uh, with um, lecture four on maritime transport. And this is a kind of an important part of a course in international transportation. And uh, two lectures was given on that topic. Uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, crucial for the main part of uh, international trades flows are served by maritime transport. Different, <coughs> um, different vessels and different needs, as we shall see, but this is the, m this is the main player in uh, international trade. Uh, or international cargo flows. As we shall see later on, air transport is also important, but it's, uh, it deals with a uh, more limited amount of cargo, but of very high value. Uh, <coughs> so he, uh, he discussed technology, market structure, the, uh, the uh, intermodal interface. I also lectured a bit on, <coughs> on the intermodality. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, lecture on ports as a very important interface between land transport and sea transport. So the role of ports in an, uh, in an <coughs> international supply chain is, uh, is uh, worthwhile paying attention to. Because ports is a very interesting kind of, uh, uh, or an interesting part of this, uh, this transport chains. So, uh, <coughs> so this was the main topics of, of this lecture and also lecture number uh, seven. Uh, he went through various uh, ship categories. Uh, I will not go into detail on, on them at all, but uh, it's just uh, there are various uh, types um, with different, uh, different characteristics. You see, uh, there are quite large ships in some of these uh, segments, uh, and uh, the size is important in terms of reducing unit costs, where that is uh, where that is applicable. And it's so, of course, uh, <coughs> there are a lot of trade-offs here. Uh, whether you should use, for instance, a, a um, I just need a pointer. Whether you should use a uh, Suez Max or, or uh, something bigger to transport oil depends on uh, what kind of route you are going to, uh, to use and uh, because the Suez Max can, can uh, take a shorter route for instance between Asia and Europe than, uh, than, uh, than the larger vessels. 
So there is a trade-off between size and uh, of ships, unit costs, and, and needs of the of the customers, and the willingness to pay by by the customers. You have various uh, categories within each of these uh, these uh, four main groups. So this is actually what I'm <coughs> what I'm aiming at: this uh, economies of scale properties within sea transport. And uh, you see that if you go upwards in the size of uh, of ships, you uh, sort of uh, um, increase, depending on what which way you go. Of course, you increase uh, the unit costs if you in steps if you go from one ship category to a smaller one, for instance you increase the unit costs per, uh, per ton. Um, this scale effect is shown here for various ships, ship types. But you have exactly the same figure, but with different numbers, of course. If you consider one single ship, the unit costs per ton is decreasing up to the capacity limit of the ship. And this cost structure was, uh, I, I, uh, I discussed that a bit when we talked about uh, the, the relationship between road transport and rail transport. Where rail transport had this economies of scale uh, characteristic, whereas road transport had the opposite the decreasing returns to scale, the cost curve increased because of uh, congestion problems in the road network. <coughs> but the problem is that the problem in terms of intermodal transportation involving uh, sea transport is that you need quite a lot of cargo to fill a ship. And that is, uh, that is a challenge when you talk about uh, all kinds of sea transport, but uh, particularly if you are going to use sea transport in, uh, in thin markets, like, uh, like say the Norwegian market with uh, 5 million people, and if you are going to, to really use sea transport as a mode to replace, uh, to replace trucks for exports to Europe, <coughs> you, need, you need volume. You need high volume. But these this cost characteristics and the implications of this cost structure is, uh, is something that you should, uh, you should be aware of when you, when you prepare for the exam. So <coughs> This is just a, a summary of vessel types. Lots of, uh, of uh, vessels that can be adapted to, uh, to the needs of, of, the, of the shippers. Uh, various vessel types here, and uh, you should have an overview of those, of course. Um, trends in this market when it comes to, to ship size. Crude oil vessels are already big and uh, there is a limit to everything. So, so they are not increasing in, uh, in size, but all other types are increasing. There was a new record that was set some not very long ago with this new Maersk a uh, container ship, for instance. Uh, it's some of the same here, uh, quite large vessels at the outset for, for this group, but there is a, there is a tendency towards larger units. <coughs> and that has to do with scale effects that drives this, this, uh, this trend. And there is scale, scale effects on the vessel, uh, for the vessels. The unit cost per, per, uh, per ton is, is decreasing with size. 
but it's also a result of consolidation to to a smaller number of uh, of distribution centers, uh, perhaps a smaller number of big ports that can take these uh, ships, and so we have a scale also on the terminal side. And the ports are becoming bigger and more efficient. Hub and spoke. <coughs> you should uh, you should know what that is. In sea transport, you have uh, you have the big hubs like the Rotterdam port, which uh, serves uh, the deep sea, uh, for instance, container ships, and then you have feeder vessels that takes cargo to to smaller ports around uh, around Europe. In 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 the case of Rotterdam, feeding to and from this big port. And you have the same situation in, uh, on, the, on the other side of the transport chain, which is in many cases uh, Eastern Asia. Where, for instance, Hong Kong has a, and Singapore has larger, very large container ports. So the trade flows are shown here. <coughs> These numbers summarizes to 200%. Um, and there is a, a strong trade between uh, Europe and, uh, and Asia, 23%. Not very much goes around Africa. Uh, there is, uh, there is um, the most of it goes through the Suez Canal. Uh, there is also a quite strong intra-Asian trade in uh, in this uh, in this region. Here, <coughs> so you see here the the main. Trade links, <coughs> three main trade links, Trans-Pacific, Trans-Atlantic and uh, Asia-Europe. Uh, the major areas where, <coughs> where you source cargo for bulk transports are in, in the Middle East, North and West Africa, the North Sea. Uh, for oil and for, uh, for ore, you have these countries, uh, Australia, South America, and Canada, coal, Australia, South Africa, China, and so on, so forth. So, uh, the, 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 these are sort of the basics of, uh, of world trade patterns. And the interesting question could be to address, for instance, what will happen here if you if you get uh, if you get a change like we discussed on a lecture, back sourcing of uh, of production. If you get a situation where uh, cost the cost level, for instance, in China uh, starts to increase, what will happen to these flows? Yeah, this is just a, a division a pie chart showing uh, showing the the world seaboard trade based on different uh, types of uh, of cargo. Tanker market trends. Um, regional demand follows stages of development, meaning that uh, it has to do with uh, with uh, economic growth. It's strongly li linked to economic growth, uh, <coughs> regional as well as uh, as uh, the development in global uh, in the global economy. We saw a quite steep decrease in demand when uh, when the credit crunch came in 2008. Uh, the energy mix of regions is important, and. Uh <coughs> 
Today there is uh, some attention towards shale gas from the United States as a competitor to, uh, to LNG, which we, uh, we make in, uh, here in, uh, in Norway, like up north in, uh, in Finnmark. And outside the coast here, we export quite a lot of LNG through pipelines. And the decisions <coughs> to um, build those quite expensive pipelines from, from this region was made before the shale gas project uh, or the shale gas was started to be extracted in the, in the US. Um, from Finnmark there is a, a seaborne uh, transport. They use LNG ships to, to, to transport the gas, which is kind of more flexible, uh, whereas the pipelines have very high initial costs, but on the other hand, very low uh, transmission costs. It doesn't cost much to, to transport the gas through the pipelines. Much cheaper per unit than the ship, but the, the, the initial costs are high, and hence the average costs could be a problem <coughs> in the future as compared to, uh, to sea transport with the from the US and other parts with the shale gas. So it's quite, it's quite interesting to, to follow this, uh, this, this market for, uh, for gas in the future now. I know some of you are, are looking into this, uh, this gas transport issue in your, in your assignment. It's mentioned here. New trade routes <coughs> are, of course, uh, of interest. Uh, I did a study together with a, a PhD student some couple of years back, which was published, published in Journal of Transport Geography. We dealt with the Northern Sea Route and the possibilities in terms of uh, shifting trade flows between, between Suez Canal or going uh, north of uh, of Russia to to uh, to northern Norway and from south from there. So a question could be to let's say make you reflect upon what will a stable, ice-free northern sea route in terms of, of trade flows and what could the implications be from that to discuss that would that be okay <laughs> um, just a slide to show the the growth in uh, in uh, vessels container, generalized cargo, multi-purpose, purpose, purpose uh, vessels, reefers that cools down the cargo, and roll on, roll off. You see that the container ships has uh, is the sort of winner in this. They are, uh, have a, had a very strong growth. Um, not surprising from what I said a bit earlier on. Whereas generalized cargo has uh, has declined, it's easy to see the transfer from that to to, to containerization. Yeah, we can uh, we can break after this one. Um, The volatility of the shipping market is much higher than, for instance, in the in the in the stock market. Um, it's uh, interesting because you can use. I don't know whether uh, Harald Yeller showed you that, but you can actually use the Baltic freight index for dry bulk 
to forecast what will happen to the global economy. Because the, the Baltic Freight Index and, the global, uh, and the, that index is determined. Some, I don't, I'm not quite sure about how long ahead, but the, uh, the, the freight index is, is determined or, or estimated uh, for some uh, time into the future. And it has a very strong correlation with the, the, the development in the economy. So if, if the Baltic freight index is, uh, is uh, going down, meaning that the freight rates are, are starting to go down, and freight rates starts to go down when there is a slope in demand, of course, and that is a symptom of, uh, of uh, harder times in the global economy. So if you see that the Baltic freight index is starting to go down, you can expect something to happen with the global economy. It has been a very strong correlation. So <coughs> the credit crunch of 2008 was sort of, could be observed in that, uh, in that market. So the market is often, uh, can often perceive or have a perception that something will happen. That the, the inventories of uh, oil and gas is full. Why are they full? Yes, because something has started to happen, starting, is starting to happen with demand for manufactured goods and so on. And then that strikes right into the, the freight rates for, for various cargo. In the container market, <coughs> initiatives have taken for further market consolidation because that has again to do with scale effects, bigger units, lower costs. That possibility is sort of not there when it comes to the tanker market because the ships are already big. There is not much more to gain from increasing the size, as we saw here. Okay, I think we need a break before I continue.